St. Calixtus, the Pope and the Martyr is perhaps known by anyone who's gone to Rome because the most famous catacombs bear his name, the catacombs of St. Calixtus or the uh, Catacombe de Calisto. Part of the reason why, well, because uh, he was buried there originally, you found his uh, grave there, and he was also the caretaker before becoming Pope, before being a bishop as a deacon, he was also the caretaker of uh, the cemeteries. One of the first uh, acts, and it's considered a corporal act of mercy, is to take care of the dead, to tend to those who have passed on. And a way of actually doing that in the ancient church, and well still today, it's the caretaking of a cemetery, whether it be the digging and, or the maintaining of the gra graves in the ground. The cemeteries and Christians were always linked hand in hand. It was one of the first properties the church ever had, actually, were the cemeteries that were located outside of the walls of Rome almost in a kind of no man's land that was by outside of the walls and therefore outside of the protection of the law of Rome. These uh, cemeteries were quite large. I mean, there's several miles underground. You can go in different levels and go through the centuries of Christian history, seeing all the graves of those who have gone before us. In those graves, we find also the graves of the early martyrs. And well, that first devotion to the martyrs, the first, the, the call to the catacombs and and the veneration of the other martyrs really starts in that context where the early Christians, once they had identified a martyr, such as Calixta, they believed, well, the resurrection will come first to those saintly people or to those martyrs. So we want to be there. We want to be close to it. Because if the resurrection comes here first, then I'll probably be there with them too. And so there was already the devotion to be buried next to the martyrs or be buried as close as you can to where there was uh, a grave or where the martyr was buried. And so St. Calixtus is associated with those, uh, with those, uh, uh, with the catacombs in that sense. However, an interesting thing we see here in the readings, a lot of it talks about service. Service, something that we're very familiar with, and the greatness of service. On the one hand, we see in the first uh, reading how the presbyters or those early priests and those early bishops it was called that they shouldn't lord their position over the flock. They shouldn't lord themselves over the faithful. On the contrary, humility. Take a position of humility even if the position is great or the position you hold in a community is great. This is in great contrast to what we see in society, not only in society back then, but even today. Who are the first among society? We hear it also in the gospel in here. And Jesus presents a different way or a different definition of who is the greatest. He calls on something that we're quite used to. Think about those who have titles. They're great. You know, they, whether they have a title of president or a title of a CEO or title of whatever. And kind of the way so that we defer to, to people with great titles. A lot of times we defer and these titles or the, the greatness of the person it's based on something they had done in the past, a past deed, a past accomplishment. And we do tend to rest on our laurels, sort of. When we've done something great and that um, feat is done and gone, well, I kind of live off of that. And some can actually live off of that forever for the rest of their lives. And what is the problem in here? In a certain way, the, uh, the, the, the temptation to rest on one's laurels is also to lord it over another. To keep on living of the past, the past glory, and impose it on the present and even in the future. And Jesus tells his disciples, who is the greatest here? The one seated or the one serving? Or the one serving? Normally, and all logic would say, well, it's the one being served. That's why he's great. But Jesus poses a different one. He says, obviously, I am the greater one amongst everyone, yet I'm the one who's serving. The action of the Lord is an action in being, is an action in doing. It's not an action of the past, for the Lord continues to act, continues to create, continues to save. And so the Lord's greatness, and, and, and well, we confess it and every time we say the Gloria, for your great glory, is not of a God past, a God of the distant past or of history and that no longer acts and we only look back at past deeds. But his greatness all is rooted in the present, 
in his being, in his action, for he does not stop. And so the same is for the apostle, for the disciple, for the one who is to be an apostle. The greatness of the apostle is not because, oh yeah, a long time ago I did something for Christ, but it's in the three questions we have right behind you. ¿Qué he hecho por Cristo? No se queda ahí nada más. Pero ¿qué hago por Cristo? ¿Qué he de hacer por Cristo? We don't just sit in what I've done for Christ and be content with that. But our calling is into what I do for Christ now. What am I doing present? And what do I still have to do for Christ? That will be what determines the greatest in heaven and on earth in a Christian way. And so in a time when we are right now evaluating who's the greatest in our society in a certain way, pay attention to the way the discourse goes a lot of times. How often does the discourse, the political discourse, rest on the past, on something done and over with? How much of it rests on what is present? Oh, everyone talks about what they're gonna do and what they did. What about what they're doing? That perhaps will help us also guide us in our way of evaluating and judging what is going on. So in this time, let's use that greatness of San Calisto, who is also a servant amongst others, who did not lord his position as bishop, as leader of the Christian community, but rather as a servant, as a humble servant, the humbleness even to the death of the martyr. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.